what a great crowd here. Yeah. Yeah. What a fantastic crowd for the launch of Harry Gosvick's new book, oh, Capitalism, yeah. a Crime yeah. Story. I'd like to welcome you all. My name is Angela. I'm the events coordinator here at Another Story Bookshop. Um, we're one of Toronto's oldest independent bookshops. We were founded 31 years ago. We've got, a, most of you know us. For those of you who don't, welcome. For those of you who are longtime customers, it's great to see you again. So before we get going with the actual event, I would like to um, offer our land acknowledgement. The sacred land on which we operate has been a site of human activity for 15,000 years. This land is the territory of the Huron-Wendat and Petun First Nations, the Mississaugas of the Credit River, and the nations of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Ojibwe and Allied Nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. <coughs> Turo Wampum says we are going to live on this land together and respect each other's sovereignty. The Dish with One Spoon is an agreement that recognizes that we live off the same resources. It is hard to eat a collective meal together off a dish with one spoon, hence protocols are put in place to ensure mutual respect and accountability to each other and to the land. Ontario is covered by 46 treaties and other agreements. Today, the meeting place of Toronto is still the home to Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. Our intersecting communities are comprised of those native to this land, Indigenous people from other territories, as well as settlers who have come here by choice, force, or otherwise a result of colonialism and imperialism. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission 94 Calls to Action reaffirms that the treaties with Indigenous peoples must be lawfully honoured. We are all treaty people and are responsible for honouring and upholding these agreements. We are grateful for this opportunity to work on this territory and to share space with all of you. So before we have Harry speak, I want to do a special shout out to his publisher, Between the Lines. I thank all the publishers at all the events because, you know, we wouldn't be a bookstore without our publishers. Mm -hmm. But they are a very special publisher. They've been around for, what, 35 years? 40. 40 years. 40. <laughs> they are one of the most solidly on the left activist booksellers that have, we are so just, they're a jewel. They're a treasure. Um, and we're so thankful. They've published all of Harry's books. And we're so thankful to have them publishing such important, critical work. So thank you to all the staff who work so hard. We've got the former staff here today, too. There's Peter Stephen, Matt Adams, we've got Dave, we've got Renee. So thank you to Between the Lines for publishing Harry's work. They're really important. So without further ado, I mean, I don't think Harry needs much introduction, but I'm going to read your introduction. <laughs> Harry Glasbeck is Professor Emeritus and Senior Scholar at Osgoode Hall Law School, York University. He's also taught at the Universities of Melbourne and Monash in Australia and the University of Western Ontario. He's the author of 10 books, including Wealth by Stealth, Corporate Crime, Corporate Law, and The Perversion of Democracy, which sold by the bucket loads. Um, this book here, Class Privilege, and the new book that we're celebrating, Capitalism, A Crime Story. We've got these books for sale, and Harry will sign after yeah. the event. So please join me in welcoming Harry Glasper. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you all for coming, yeah. especially my favorite grandchild, Sasha. <laughs> <laughs> it is good to be here and talk about this work. It's a little work, and it's called Capitalism, a Crime Story. Partly, of course, it's got that title to attract attention, but mostly because I want to convey a meaning. And the meaning is that Capitalism, ordinary acts of capitalism, are criminal in nature. That's what I'm trying to t say in this book. Now, when I say criminal in nature, remember I'm a lawyer. I I'm not using this as an epithet or an insult or to be provocative. <laughs> I, I mean it definitionally. Literally. And so I come at this as a lawyer and as law supposedly reflects our shared values and norms. If we take that seriously, and we take laws holding out seriously, then I think I can make this case that capitalism, ordinary acts of capitalism, are criminal in nature. Now, of course, I say ordinary because I don't want to talk about all the antisocial behavior about which we all know. Uh, I don't know, uh, deliberately. Uh, pouring mercury 
into indigenous people's water basins uh, for decades, consciously poisoning people with asbestos mining and processing, uh, putting ignitions in cars, leaving them there, knowing they switch off and people get killed, uh, or uh, selling infant baby formula to people who are going to mix it with impure water and their babies will be sick and possibly die all done consciously or putting a tank so far back in a car that it will explode on touch consciously uh, or uh, for banks to sell insurances take the premiums knowing that the policyholders cannot recover because they're not eligible or stealing and manipulating by conspiring on exchange rates and uh, interest rates we know all that stuff. Or well, recently, the big issue now is wage theft, where employers don't pay employees what they're owed, although they've notionally earned it. The mm -hmm. uh, United States just put out a report that amounts to $20 billion a year, every year. Uh, no, I don't want to talk about any of that. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the other books were about. <laughs> I want to talk about conduct that we see as normal, not remarkable. That's what I think is important to say, that that is criminal in nature. Now, of course, when I say capitalism, some people, I suspect no one in this room needs help finding, trying to work out what it is, but just for the base, I'll just say what I think it is. It's a system uh, whereby there is a drive to privately, privately accumulate socially produced wealth in a competitive setting. Now, on the face of it, nothing's good about that. <laughs> right? Uh, it requires an appropriation by some of others' product, and it requires people to take advantage of each other and of their environments. Now, it's hard to know how that sells. In Australia, where I sometimes spend time, uh, there, there's a lot of fuss about asylum seekers, and some people try to help the asylum seekers. And there's a great pamphlet they've got out, and it shows uh, people sitting at a table, and there are 20 cookies on the table. And uh, the banker sits there and he takes 19. And then says to the worker sitting there, Watch out! The asylum seeker is going to take your cookie. <laughs> Or alternatively, a slogan I also like, I think I, when I think of capitalism, from each according to her vulnerability, <laughs> to each according to his greed. <laughs> so I don't like it. But despite its obvious failings, it's pervasive. It's a system that rules everything. It affects our economics, our politics, our cultures, our social relations. It's ubiquitous. It's all, everywhere we look, right here in this store. And people, of course, are impacted differentially by it. It sets people against each other automatically, because they're competing, remember? And they have different interests, they have to survive. So, uh, public sector against private sector workers, and workers, uh, male workers against female workers, all workers against workers in foreign jurisdiction which can do it cheaper, environmentalists battling trade, same with the environment because people want to, wor want to work and use and mold that environment. You know all that. People react to all the particular problems they have, but they fight from within silos. They fight unconnected to each other. It's very hard to uh, overcome that problem. recently deceased Samir Amin once wrote that movements form as people struggle against their particular plight which is inflicted upon them by capitalism and uh, but that revolt does not amount to revolution more is needed and what's needed of course is some sense of coalescence of all the people who are oppressed by one ubiquitous system I don't know how to do that. There's a modest attempt at a contribution. My idea is that if I can help show and un make people understand that 
their particular oppression comes from the same phenomenon as all the other people's oppression, namely criminality, they might have a common thread. They might develop tactics that will help them overcome their differences. But that's a hope. Apart from anything else, it's fun to make the argument. <laughs> <laughs> so here is the argument. In our polity, in our uh, law sees itself as protecting our values and norms, and the partic at the center of that is the sacrosanct nature of the individual. The notion that each individual is autonomous and sovereign, therefore equal to all other autonomous sovereign people. Now, of course, law is not stupid. It knows that people have different talents and different resources. But it allows for that. You can keep your resources. In fact, that's a given. Private property is to be protected at all costs. Mm -hmm. And of course, they can't take away your talents. So that's a given. But within that system, we're all equal. Politically, philosophically, and most importantly, legally. Mm. We're all to be treated as equals. We're all to be allowed to think as we like, to act as we like. <laughs> no one is to tell us what to think or how to act within that scheme. Coercion is the enemy of the system. Mm. That's the enemy. And that's true when the government intervenes, because the government intervenes, because if we all think and act as we do, we're likely to collide. So it coordinates. And it coordinates. And sometimes it reallocates the outcomes of the use of our talents and resources, depending on which government, which time you're in. <coughs> so it has the power to coerce as it does this. So we worry about governments coercing us. And so we try to constrain them. We have constitutions to do that. In Canada and in Quebec, we have bills of rights, charters of rights and freedoms. And they specifically provide, watch my language, watch my lips. We're guaranteed freedom to speak, freedom to think, freedom to associate, because we're equal, sovereign, autonomous. And the government needs to justify any intervention with that. And that's to be adjudicated by independent judiciaries. So the state is to be constrained as well. Coercion is the enemy of the system. That's my starting point. <laughs> now, if coercion is the enemy, if coercion is the enemy, does the state ever forbid anything, anyone from doing anything? Well, of course it does. For instance, uh, we know it's wrong to murder, uh, to physically assault someone, or to uh, uh, rob them, steal. These are all repugnant acts, and you can see how we all would agree, oh, let's, <coughs> let's stop that. But they're also, importantly, coercive acts. Everyone is coercive. That's why we find it easy that's why we are justified in prohibiting them. We talk a lot about morality, but we're not sure what that means. For instance, when coercion is not so evident, we become very ambivalent about what should be criminal, which is what I've been talking about, right? Murder, assaults, and so on. Uh, I don't know, exa easy examples. It's hard to know whether you should be allowed to possess, use, buy, and sell drugs of a certain kind. At the moment, you can't do that with cocaine, we forbid that, heroin, and until tonight, <laughs> marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> but on the other hand, we're not quite sure why. For instance, we don't do it to alcohol, although it's done in some parts of the world, and it's done in this part of the world. Tobacco, coffee, sugar. Why do we pick those? Hmm. Nothing obvious about it. Or we have equal difficulty with uh, sex workers. How do we deal with them? Do we treat them as people engaged in an occupation? Or do we find some kind of ground for forbidding them from acting in that way? Uh, or for that matter, uh, I don't know, a woman's right to demand an abortion as her choice. Or person desiring to have assisted suicide. 
And we find all those difficult. We are ambivalent about all of those because there's no coercion. Coercion is pivotal to making up our minds as to what's right and wrong. It's pivotal to the law. Now, it doesn't always get it right. I'm not trying to make any argument like that. But coercion is a very important element. So let me make that clear how that works in policy terms. And these are some of the things I do in this little book. I, I play with some, of course, I elaborate this argument a little, not much. Uh, we hear a lot about uh, tax schemes at the moment. That will do as an example. Uh, when a government decides to take money from people who have property and income, for whatever government purposes it has, when it does that, of course, is being coercive if the people don't want to give it to them. It needs to be coercive. So the government has the burden of justifying this. It must justify that it has a right to take, remember, private property is sacrosanct. It has a right to take it. Difficult. It's much easier to pretend that it's better left in the hands of the private owner and that will do is just as much good as to try and justify a taking, which is always wrong, fundamentally wrong. And therefore, that same notion turns to the person who has the money and doesn't want to give it up. Because it becomes morally righteous, sound, to not let that government have it by taking. And then you get Panama and Luxembourg and other islands and Nevada. That's where it goes, because it's honorable to do so in a world where coercion is not permitted. <coughs> At the other end, by the way, it explains the problem with welfare, right? When the government actually takes, watch my lips, takes some of the money, gives it to some people, it has to justify it, it does so by narrowly defining the category of people to whom it can give. Hmm. And if people don't fall with that category, they can't have it because they will be part to coercion, unjustified coercion. The burden then becomes on the welfare recipient. Coercion is important to us in all our thinking. I go outside in this dangerous neighborhood <laughs> and a fellow comes up to me with a weapon of mass destruction and says, your money or your life it's a crime. Right? It's clear. Why? It's coercive. It's as clear as, as clear as can be. It's coercive. I go to work. My employer fills my lungs with noxious fumes. I choke. I go to the employer and say, stop that. Give me a fan, a mask, stop the fumes. And he might very well say, he might do it by the way. He might be a nice guy for all I know. But basically, he might say, no, I can't do it. I'll tell you what, if you work for much less, I'll stop some of the fumes because it costs money to do so. He's coercing me. It's not a crime. And that's the thing. We pretend, law pretends, that economic coercion, that is coercion exercised by capitalists, is not coercion that falls foul of our basic rules. That's a whole pretense. We do that at work, right? Worker goes to work, why? Because she has to. She has no capital to live on because in our unequally divided <coughs> society where the means of production are owned by relatively few people and they don't watch my lips again because we don't coerce they don't have to invest it they can just sit on it and eat it for as long as they like they can just sit there and by the way that, that explains other rules in law to you that's why we have no duty to rescue in law. 
You watch a baby die in a puddle of water and you don't pick up the baby, that's not a crime. Because you have no duty to help other people, because if there were such a duty, this would not be good for capitalism. They would have to share. So they don't have to invest. Other people have to invest, and the only thing they've got to invest is their bodies and their minds. And they must invest them or exploit them themselves. Those are the two choices they have. Because those are not very good choices, you get lotteries on TV. Imagine the freedom. <laughs> so they have, they must work for those who have. To pretend that they're not being coerced to go to work is clearly a fallacy. Some people are lucky and they have a choice of employers. Whoever the great soccer player or hockey player of the day is. Most do not. Most do not have a choice. And they work. To have no choice and to work for somebody else is clear coercion. The employers, the would-be employers, of course benefit from there being as much competition amongst would-be workers as possible. A bit of unemployment never does any harm. Technologies that will replace workers easily does no harm. The ability to go to a foreign country where labor is cheaper does no harm. And they do all of things. None of them are considered crimes, even though they're clearly coercive. Every one of them. These are called business plans. <laughs> Not coercive. Yeah. You can see I can think of many examples. But I'll just make this one a little worse. Remember what it is that the worker does when she goes to work. The employer invests capital. The worker invests herself. She invests her mind, her body, her dexterity, her flexibility, her imagination. She invests what makes her an autonomous, sacrosanct individual. And she's always fighting to keep some of it for herself. That's what capital labor disputes are about. That's all they're about. She, they're always saying, you haven't got that much of me for that much money. That's all they are. People are forced to sell chunks of themselves, making them different human beings than they would be. If that's not coercive, I don't know what is. And then law gives them a hand. Law says, not only that, but every time you enter into such a contract, you have a duty of loyalty to your employer. That is, look after him first, not yourself. Hmm. Exercise as much skill as you must, can master reasonably. And of course, most significantly, obey. Obey. Orders me. And even when workers win, because occasionally they win, of course, they form unions, they get legislative help, all of this, as a result of these silo fights that I was began with, as they get some of these things to help them out, these fundamentals remain in place. So, for instance, under grievance arbitration, as we know it in Canada and the United States, when employers have difficulties with their employees, they're not loyal, they're not of good faith, they don't exercise enough skill, they swore at a foreman, they don't obey orders. They can punish them. They can punish them. We think it's a major breakthrough that we've found a mechanism to measure the pen punishment for them. That's what we do. It's a corrective discipline. Watch my lips. I know I speak English funny. <laughs> it's a disciplinary system in the private sector for capitalists that equates the state system. 
coercion is everywhere. Well, of course, you say to me, this is nonsense, and it is. Because after all, I've just, you've just admitted there are some wins every now and again. Right? People get victories, and so they get systems that offset some of the worst aspects of this kind of coercion. And that's true. That's true, of course. But again, that kind of protection is always transient, it's impermanent, it's contingent, because the fundamentals never change. So sometimes they're more protective, sometimes less protective. You're seeing it right now in Ontario. For a few minutes there was an employment stand or set of improvements, gone. Yeah. Right? Yeah. They're good to have, but they're not fundamentally embedded in the relationships. How do we get them? That's the other thing. Now, of course, what they mean by the same family? You see, the problem is always the same. Because we allow every individual to do what he or she likes with her or his property, the capitalist may not invest. <coughs> So we want them to invest so we can create wealth for everyone. So when they do invest, they're virtuous, they're benign. We need them to be best. So we inveigle them, we support them, we want them to do it, to create these relationships. In labor law we say of superior and inferior nexus relationships. We want them to create relationships where coercion is part of the deal. So they come to these uh, situations and if there is a regulation telling them what to do, uh, they'll abide by it, we hope. But because when we put things together, capital, equipment, processes, human beings, there are going to be collisions, you're going to be hurt of one kind or another. There are risks involved. Right? And these risks will, will materialize sooner or later. But when they happen and you keep on believing they're virtuous and benign and that the worker or the person who lives nearby or the consumer who is going to get the goods or the, the, buy the services which are produced in this ensemble. That's not really I always talk about workers because of what I did for a long time in my life, but this applies to every sphere you can think of. When they, when they come back, we say, well, they agreed. In fact, they inveigled us to invest and to set up the situation. They agreed to this. Again, it's this notion of assumption of that risk, <coughs> which is a pretense, an absolute pretense. Nobody assumes those risks willingly. <coughs> they assume them because they are coerced. <coughs> so, what actually happens when those risks are at? Well, how do we get a regulation? Well, really only by having enough accidents or spills. That's how we get regulations. A person puts a hand in an unguarded machine, loses the hand, accident. Ten people put their hand in the machine, lose their hand, a cluster. <laughs> 120 lose their hand, a regulation. That's how we got asbestos. Years and decades and decades of knowing. Nothing happening until finally, finally the dam burst. We maim and kill on the basis that it's an assumed risk. When the regulation is set, because people are virtuous and benign in investing, well, of course, they're asked what regulations they can live with. Mm -hmm. They're asked to participate in setting the standards. <laughs> Imagine if a thief came forward and said, look, so you're, you're ruining my occupation with these regulations. Let's talk about it. <laughs> I, I want to quote things to you. I find it after I've written the book, of course, I found much more stuff. It's sort of like, I think for women being pregnant, all of a sudden they find there are more women that are pregnant. 
I always find there is more wrongdoing after I finish something than I thought there was. <laughs> but from Boris Johnson. Remember him? <laughs> I don't like him because of his hair. Because <laughs> Boris Johnson, he said that health and safety people are sucking the moral courage out of English people and making them stupid. <laughs> David Cameron said that regulations were a millstone around businesses' neck. David Cameron, of course, inherited slave owners' money. So they are participating in setting of regulations. Adam Smith once said, you know, remember him? Adam Smith once said that you should never ask those people for advice on how to behave because they have a self-interest in getting it one way rather than any other and they're bound to lie. And that's what they do over and over and over and over again because they want to be able to coerce. Let me tell you what the regulation really means, because that's, that's the counterpoint to everything I say, isn't it? That there, that there are some victories which um, blunt the power to coerce. <coughs> it's really a permit to do harm. If you see it like that, it becomes much less attractive. The way I see it, uh, uh, this is one of my weaknesses, my spouse will tell you, I watch boxing. <laughs> and. Uh, when two boxers meet in a ring, they're going to hurt each other. It's the whole purpose, right? Or oh, hockey players, I mean, they take a pick, it doesn't make any difference. The idea is to belt each other. Now, they're not allowed to do that. We, no, we don't accept assault in our society, so they get a permit. They get a license to put on the show. And they're allowed to hurt each other within certain frameworks. For instance, there are rules. You can only hit this part and that part. You must wear gloves of a certain size and so on. You must wear a shield. You can't hit below. You can't hit them back. And certainly you cannot bite anyone. Right? And if they do any of those things, they'll be prosecuted. They certainly use all their permits. They'll be prosecuted for having behaved badly. But they need a permit to allow to inflict violence on other people, to harm other people. Within that limit you can hurt. That's what a regulation is. Uh, I'm doing a talk for Eric Tucker next week sometime, I think. And we talk about health and safety. And what health and safety regulations are just that. You can hurt somebody, provided you stay within the regulations. If you exceed the regulation, that might be wrong. Now, here is the next key. What is the wrong they've done when they breach the regulation? Remember, it's all on the basis of pretense that we assume the risk on the one hand and that they are benign on the other. What happens when they breach the regulation? Virtually nothing. <laughs> and the reason for that is because the process is different. The purpose of a regulation is not to forbid behavior, which is what the purpose of criminal law is. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. The purpose is to allow you to kill a bit, to facilitate and promote your activity to make a profit which will inure to the welfare of all of us in due course is the argument. That is the purpose of the thing. So therefore, they set a standard, they're allowed to hurt us a little bit, and when they breach it, we don't apply criminal law thinking to them. We say, oh, it's a breach of a regulation. And so, the, in fact, it's easier for the Crown to prove that there was a breach, all they have to do is prove that there was a breach, and that the person did not take due diligence, they would put the burden on the, on the investor to prove that it exercised due diligence. And the penalties are accordingly different. The stigma is different. 
the deterrence idea because we don't want to deter them, we just want to deter them a little bit. The continuum is real, by the way, because every now and again there is such a massive disaster that we then say, oh, that should have been criminalized. Right? West Ray. Black Megantique. BP oil. Then we say it should be criminalized. That is, the same regulation, but the same scheme applies. And all of a sudden we say, gee, that's not good enough. We say that for two minutes and then go back to the old time. <laughs> I'll give you a couple more examples and I'll stop because I'm tired and Sasha is tired. <laughs> I get drunk as I used to do uh, before I get into my car and I drive I'm driving along very happy in fact, I think I'm catching butterflies. <laughs> and I kill somebody. I'm clearly in breach of the Highway Traffic Act regulations. Not even an issue, is it? And I might well be charged with a homicide of one kind or another. <coughs> you know that. That's not what happens in the workplace or when a pe person for instance, breaches environmental regulations. I was reading up, preparing <coughs> seriously for this event. And I found that the Canada Environment Protection Act, over an eight-year period, <coughs> levied $2.7 million worth of fines. The Toronto Public Library <laughs> fined people $3.7 million <laughs> for late returns. <laughs> the drunk driver may go to jail, as he should. Why does he go to jail? Not because he intended to do anything. That's the last thing, I was catching butterflies, I was getting drunk. Because I was stupid. And because I was heedless of human welfare. The person who runs an enterprise decides what to make, when to make it, how to make it, who to hire, what skills to use, how long the investment shall remain, where it shall be geographically placed from time to time. All these things are decided by the investor. That's called the business plan. They're very proud of that. They calculate the risks. Why do not they do not calculate the risks to me, to the environment, to the consumer? Mm -hmm. Why don't you ask them to do that? Like we ask the driver. Because they are capitalists. Because the driver, you see, was not engaged in an ordinary capitalist activity. Mm -hmm. He was not trying to invest and to make money. He was not to, to seeking to privately accumulate wealth produ socially produced. Yeah. <clears throat> the guy who's got asbestos pours onto his workers and into the environment around him is doing exactly that. And this is the last word. I've got others, but this is the last word. <laughs> Just because, I, as I was talking about asbestos, something shot to my head. Roughly, ILO figures, roughly 107,000 people will die per annum for the next 50 years because of their exposure to asbestos. Mostly workers, of course, but also people in the environment generally. This has taken many years, of course, long latency period. In all that time, there have been no prosecutions. There have been settlements. 
fines, no prosecutions, except in Italy. There was one in Italy, a company called Eternet, which did some unspeakable things. And finally, a major CEO and major shareholder were charged and convicted. It took 16 years for trials before they were convicted of various kinds of homicide. The elder of them was 87 when that finished, and he has appealed. That's not considered criminal. Except we know it could be, but we don't make it criminal. Because we pretend that economic coercion is natural, is normal, is acceptable. It is the only way we can live. I think that's all. Thank you.